the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the Star Wars Universe. Who gives a shit? You know what I care about? The Haskew. I sound like I'm sneezing. Is that anything? It's been a minute, all right? I don't know anymore. But this is serious business, okay? I'm talking about the Harry Styles fan fiction cinematic universe. That man has unknowingly, or I guess I should say probably knowingly, just like not in the way where he's actually getting paid for it, carrying a subgenre of romance movies on his back for the past six years. And today I thought we could look through them all. So a bit of a walk down memory lane for us and a dark alleyway for him. Before we get into it, I want to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor, ThreadUp. They're an online consignment and thrift store, and they're one of the largest fashion resale platforms on the planet. I like them because it makes it a lot easier to buy secondhand, because I can sort everything by size, item brand, or color, and there's new items every day. It's pretty much the perfect combination between the ease of online shopping, but you still get all the perks of buying secondhand, whether that's finding a good deal, wanting to find some more unique pieces that you're not seeing in stores right now, or you just want to reduce your environmental impact. I usually find the stuff that I get on there by searching for my favorite brands. At this point, I only shop for free people and anthropology on Threada because while I like those brands, I do not like paying full price for either of them. And I have found so many good pieces from them on there for insane deals. For example, I got these super cute cargo pants that were originally $127 from Anthropology. I got them off ThreadUp for $29.99. I paired them with this cardigan that I also got off ThreadUp that was originally $80 from Urban Outfitters for only $25.99. It's been very windy and rainy here despite it being June, so it's been nice to have a cute pair of pants and a nice cardigan to throw on when I'm unseasonably freezing my ass off. For when it is actually warm though, I've been very into dressing like a 14 year old boy. I've been loving these cargo shorts that I got off ThreadUp that were originally $86 on Anthropology that I got for only $30.99. Also paired it with this sheer long sleeve that was originally $105 on Anthropology. I'm sorry, who was paying that? Not me. I got it for $33.99 on ThreadUp. And listen, it's the summer. I want a nautical outfit. So I got this pullover. It's super light, so it's not gonna make me sweaty. It's just something cute to throw on by the water. This was originally from Urban Outfitters and was listed for $64, but I got it off ThreadUp for $20.99. I also paired it with this anthropology bucket hat. Super cute. It's like kind of velvety almost. It's just very soft, which was originally $62, but I got it for $23.99. If you like some of the stuff that I picked up, ThreadUp actually has a feature where you can see the stuff that I ordered as well as a bunch of different items that I favorited that you guys can check out and shop for yourself. And right now you can get 45% off plus free shipping on your first order with code Casey. I really could not recommend them more. Definitely check them out if you're interested. Rest of the details will be down in the description box, but otherwise let's get back into the video. Now I do have to bring out the timeline, which I mean, it's impossible to talk about this phenomenon without talking about where it all began, which of course was the after movie in April of 2019. Snaps for after everyone. Can we get some snaps for after please? If you're a long time viewer, you know I have a bit of a history with this franchise that for some reason involves a clown wig, but I gave up on the after franchise after the third movie, okay? I only had so much in me and looking at the forecasting for how many of those goddamn movies were still yet to come out, I thought to myself, you know what? I'm good actually. In total, there are five of these movies, but they are finished. This is in fact a closed case. I know a certain franchise that can't relate to that. <laughs> but this means I only missed out on two of the movies, so obviously I watched them. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. There's actually something in between all the after movies that dabbles in Harry Styles fan fictionary. And that's the third episode from the first season of Euphoria that came out in June of 2019. What was in the water in 2019 is my question. This easily takes the cake as the most explicitly obvious reference to Harry Styles fan fiction because the episode so it quite literally follows the character Kat as she writes Larry Stylins in fanfiction. The first night. A 7,000 word fic that was largely credited with starting the Larry Stylinson conspiracy theory. Which if you know the history of Larry Stylinson, this is the equivalent of like poking a hornet's nest, but you're also naked and covered in honey for some reason. You had people that were mad that the shit was brought up so blatantly, another pack of people that thought that this meant that Larry actually was real and that Harry and Louie had used HBO as some sort of vessel to send out a bat signal. And it did in fact get so messy that one half of the ship ended up addressing it. Louie ended up talking about it on both Twitter and in interviews following the episode's release, saying he was neither given heads up or approval, which honestly, Considering the history of Larry, whoever wrote that into the show definitely knew what they were doing. So I'm really shocked they didn't check with him first. Like not even changing the name is crazy. Why don't we like mix it up a bit? Jerry Stylicious? Even though this episode is the most blatant, the series as a whole only really mentions this once in this one episode as a way to kind of build Kat's backstory and doesn't really mention it again in comparison to the movies we'll be looking at that are more coy about admitting Harry's influence but have the entire story focused around characters that were inspired by him. Beyond that though, we really do just fall right back into a very 
long, long line of after movies. Where we left off with the last movie, Hardin had just caught his mom the day before her wedding hooking up with Vance. And you might be wondering, who is Vance? I was also wondering this because I forgot. Vance is this guy who owns a publishing company in the movie, and it also turns out that he was Hardin's real father. Meaning that the guy that Hardin thought was his biological father his whole life, who had also been incredibly abusive to him and his mother, was actually just some random dude. In response to everything going on though, Hardin decides he's going to burn his mom's house down. And while this is going on, Tessa and him are partaking in some trauma olympics. My mom lied to me about who my real dad was. Well, my dad was a drug addict. It's not a fucking competition! Is somebody gonna match my trauma? Sorry, that was so stupid. Surprise, surprise, they do in fact not stay away from each other, and instead opt to fuck in a cyber truck with some guy like cursive singing in the background. And Tessa's in her feelings in the cyber truck, all right? She's telling Hardin, I wanna stay like this forever. Well, girl, I don't. Let's go. So after this really touching moment, Hardin decides he's actually going to fuck off with a bunch of his friends at a party and Tess has to go find him. Who is this diva, by the way? 10 seconds on screen and went, let me put on a show, actually. I know you guys are bored. But Tessa shows up to this party and she catches Hardin with a girl in his arm. And when one of Hardin's friends asks, oh, do you guys know each other? He doesn't say anything. Tess gets upset and she runs off. And if you've watched any of the after movies before, you're probably sitting there feeling a bit of deja vu. And that would be because this exact scenario happens in every single one of these movies. I'm not kidding. You piece of shit. They end up fighting, she breaks a glass, Fucking hell. he punches a wall. Ah. Flash forward to some thrilling commentary on my part. Tessa, on the other hand, finds her dad dead from an overdose, and Hardin, of course, is such a loving, supportive boyfriend about it. Fuck! Tessa's mom at this point is like, please, for the love of God, break up with this girl. You know which secondary character I miss? Trevor. Bring his silly ass back. He can't even be in these movies anymore now though because he's in his own after franchise. Like a bootleg one. Like this shit just never ends. Tessa ends up moving to New York without Hardin though, while Hardin ends up hanging out with his fake dad that he thought was his real dad his whole life, who has since cleaned up his act and he's like, I still love you even though you're not my son. And you might be sitting there thinking, wow, things are really starting to look up. Then they get in a fight, another fight, and then another fight. You know what? Thank God for Netflix's spatial audio on this. It really adds some much needed body to the film, if you will. Is it doomed? Is it? I feel like we can make this work. Yes. It is doomed, all right? A whole lot of nothing happens, but Hardin does go to AA, and that guy from the last movie who looks like Joey Graceffa is back. Hey, Joey. Then we flash forward five years, Tess has bangs now, and a brat tie. <laughs> and she finds out that Hardin has been writing about her ever since their first kiss. And now that book is getting published and there's a bidding war for it. And Tess is not getting a dime, which if I was her, I'd be going fine bros on his ass. And get this, the book is called After. They part ways very angry at each other though, and he ends up publishing the book anyway. And later down the line, he does a book signing that Tessa shows up to, but then she leaves before he can see her. And that movie ends with a to be continued. The final movie in the franchise was released in 2022 and was called After Ever Happy, which by the way, was borderline impossible to find. When I did eventually find it on Netflix, I could only find it in French. J'aurais pas le passé. Tu n'as rien à faire ici. I have no idea what she just said, but I'm like 99% sure she just gagged his ass. But back to the movie. When I say that this franchise was falling off the bone at this point, Michael is gone. Trevor is gone. Tess is gone. Candace King is gone. That dude who originally played Vance is gone. But I'm still here. Help. But it turns out this entire movie is about Hardin. He's at a club drunk though, and he's like imagining Tess there, throwing it back over piano music. We learn that he's late on his advance for his sequel book though, but it turns out he can't write anything because he can't stop thinking about Tess. So his mom suggests that he goes to Lisbon to talk to some girl named Natalie that he has a past with. So he shows up to Natalie's place of work and she kicks him out. And then we get 10 minutes of footage of this guy just walking around Lisbon. But then we get a flash forward to five years earlier where Hardin is with a bunch of his friends. And after Natalie walks in, he ends up making a bet with one of his friends that he could sleep with her. And in order to prove that he's able to do it, he's gonna film it and then show it to them later. Which sounds an awful lot like the original plot of the After fanfic, at least for the first book in that series, where Harry's character had taken the bloody sheets after sleeping with Tess to then show his friends to prove that he had taken her virginity, which had been completely left out of the first After movie. Back to the movie though, we find out that Hardin did actually go through with all of this. He filmed it, showed it to one of his friends, and then his friends sent to a bunch of people and Natalie found out. And when we go back to present day, he's able to meet with Natalie again and is like, listen, I'm trying to be a better person. And Natalie's like, you know what? 
Sure, let's all hang out with my friends. That's when we're introduced to Sebastian and a bunch of other girls that Natalie hangs out with. Harden and Sebastian have like a bad boy off or something. I don't know, something British is going on over there. It's called After. No way, why had that make you movie? Oh, Harry Styles should play you. Thank you. Now hold on. I do have to respect this level of troll just a smidge. It was the last movie. They're like, why not? Sebastian and Harden end up getting in a fight though. It's a bit extra, obviously, but like, Get him again for me. It does get way too intense though. Harden ends up in jail and has to get bailed out by Vance. They're talking with Vance and Natalie though. He realizes that maybe he should have asked Tess for permission before writing that book. And in fact, maybe he should have asked for permission regarding a lot of things. After having the come to Jesus though, he has like a skip in his step. He's writing his book now when he goes back home to go to Landon's wedding. Before he leaves, Natalie tries to kiss him and he's like, listen, I can't. I'm still in love with Tessa. But the book he ends up finishing in Lisbon is called Before, and it's about the entire situation with Natalie. And this time he does ask her, he's like, hey, is it cool if I write this book? And she's like, of course. And then he buys her a house. Like, Tess, I know you're barely in this movie, but we need to pay attention, all right? We need royalties, a house, and a restraining order. Also, there is one more big emotional scene before Hardin leaves Lisbon. He's like walking on a beach, and while he's there, there's a bunch of flashbacks of Tess from the old movies. Like, her ass was not showing up to set for this one. She went, I did my time, all right? I did the four years. Fuck off. He also draws a heart on the beach with an H and a T in it. Once Harden's back from Lisbon though, and he's at the wedding, we find out that it's been 25 months since Tess and Harden have seen each other. And Tessa looks great. Let's make it 25 more. They end up dancing though, and he apologizes and she forgives him. But during Harden's best man speech, he starts kind of talking about him and Tess a bit and she like runs off because- we can't just talk about us like that about our souls. Oh. While they're having their moment though, Harden realizes, I love you, I wanna marry you. And the music gets super sappy, he gets down on one knee. I don't know why, but the look on his face is killing me. And then it flash forwards to Tessa and him having a kid and she's pregnant with another. Like that's how it ends. Congrats, I think. Now at this point in the timeline as Harry Styles, you'd be breathing a sigh of relief thinking it's over. We're done. Maybe we move on to BTS. What about those fanfics? <laughs> but oh no, this man got one calendar year off before The Idea of You, the latest installment to the Hiskyu that came out this summer. And what's crazy is that six years in at this point, this is easily the most A-list installment. This thing has Anne Hathaway and Nicholas Galatstein in it. And Amazon has been promoting the ever-living shit out of this thing. So much so that August Moon ended up debuting on three different Billboard charts. And nearly every song off that album is at over a million streams. They even have a TikTok account. We're a boy band. Of course we have separation anxiety. We're a band, of course we cuddle. Like who is running this thing? The reason people were calling this a Harry Styles fanfic movie is because it's based on a book with the same name and that romance novel was inspired by Harry Styles. And while it was originally published in 2017, it didn't really gain any hype until 2019. The fans for this book have a fan name. It's called hashtag Hazelnuts. There's even a private Facebook group. I will not be trying to get in there. I've learned my lesson. And there's merch for the fictional band mentioned in the book, August Moon. I will say what's different about a book like The Idea of You and After though is that the idea of you didn't start as a Harry Styles fanfiction on a fanfiction website. Rather, according to the author when she spoke to Vogue, it was supposed to be a story about a woman approaching 40 and reclaiming her sexuality and rediscovering herself, just at the point that society traditionally writes women off as desirable and viable and whole. So it was quote never supposed to be a book about Harry Styles, but the character Hayes was inspired by him as well as a few other people. The author had told another blog in a different interview that she had come across a One Direction music video in 2017, and after looking into Harry a bit more, she noticed that he often dated older women, which technically she is right, but I feel like looking at the age of the people in the movie in the book, I feel like I'm not the only person that immediately thought of Caroline Flack and Harry Styles, which like, yikes. The premise of this movie though is that Anne Hathaway's character named Solène, Eva ass name by the way, we love that, is a divorced mother who has to chaperone her daughter and her friend's trip to Coachella because her ex has a work emergency and can't take them anymore. And she winds up in the trailer of August Moon's lead singer, Hayes. I'm Hayes Campbell. Why do they never not use names that start with an H? Like why not Tyler or Jim or something? And he's like, listen, do you want to like hang out and get a drink? To which she lets him know that she's actually here with her daughter to go to their meet and greet. And when he asks, oh, is she a fan? She says, well, she used to be. Which I'll admit, when I originally heard the premise for this movie, I thought it was going to be way more dramatic than it actually is. Like I thought the daughter was going to be a current super fan, that Hayes was her favorite member, and she just watched her mom take him. But this girl doesn't even really give a shit about the band. But Selene does end up leaving the trailer, and they eventually meet again at the meet and greet. By far, Zeke is the realest one in this friend group, okay? He is geeking out at this meet and greet. Big sister, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. 
So then the mom. Yes, my uh, mom. <laughs> don't look like my mom. Hey, this next part of the movie during the concert though is when me and my friends watching this collectively gasp. Because the live show segment for this thing is so obviously 1D, it's like comical. Like that is Liam Payne. Too much too soon. Also, I have to admit something. This song slaps. I don't know what you guys want me to say, okay? Spotify has been shoving this single down my throat for the past month and a half. And you know what? It's catchy. It would have fit perfectly on Take Me Home. And I'm not even the only person who thinks that, okay? Honestly, the only thing that was off about this was that they had the guys doing choreo. Like in reality, those men were doing anything but choreo. Where she gets juicy though, is that after that song, Hayes cuts the music before they jump into the next one and is like, listen, I wanna sing a solo song actually. I met this girl tonight and I'm feeling inspired. Then no joke, grabs the mic and starts singing, I like older women. And I'm not over exaggerating. And of course is gagging a bit in the crowd. She's like, oh my God, is it me? Am I the old lady? It's at this point you realize how this movie winded up being two hours long though, because they play those songs in full. Like they were getting their money's worth out of that soundtrack. And while I understand singing the entirety of Guard Down because that is a bop, I do not understand how we as a viewer had to sit through this entire snooze fest. Like this girl specifically in the crowd perfectly embodies that feeling as a fan when you're at a show for a band you love, but you have to sit through that flop ballad that somehow ended up on the set list. Solen is back from Coachella though. She had her wild week weekend and now she's turning 40. And when she goes to work at the art gallery the next day, Hayes actually shows up and buys everything in the store. And she's like, listen, this isn't a joke. And he responds by saying, no, no, I really am so passionate about these bowls that look like some sort of deflated ussie of sorts. Since he buys out all her art at the store, they go to a different warehouse and she ends up showing him this piece that she's obsessed with. What do you feel when you look at it? Everything. They get a bit emotional, they start sharing their life stories. This guy's trying to talk about his past and how he auditioned for the band in the role of Tiny Tim at the same time, and if he had gotten Tiny Tim, he would have done that instead. I'm not paying attention to anything he's saying because Miss Anne is serving. Anne, on the other hand, explains that her marriage fell apart because her ex ended up seeing somebody that he worked with. And mid-convo, she gets a phone call from her daughter Izzy, so she's like, listen, I'll be back in a second. And he's sitting there thinking, what should I do in this situation? How about I play the piano? Like, hey, chopsticks, pipe down. I can't hear the person on the other line. Anne comes back though and she's like, oh my god, what was that terrible song you were playing on the piano, Pookie? He's like, ah, you know, it's just an original. Wait, this is like his version of Don't Let Me Go. Anyway, they start hooking up. She's like, listen, I am too old for your ass. And she gets him to leave, but before he does, he ends up leaving his watch there. She spots it afterward and she's like, Oh no, I have this famous person's watch. Which honestly, girl, sell it. People used to sell Harry's water bottle for 500 bucks on eBay. At this point in the movie though, it's time for Anne to drop off Izzy at summer camp. So after doing that, she's home alone for the rest of the summer reading this big ass book. And she gets a text from an unknown number that turns out to be Hayes and he's inviting her to go to New York. Before she can reply though, she does some crucial research. She was real for this. What do you want me to say? And at this point she goes, you know what? Fuck it. And she goes. This man didn't even put her in first class though. Not only is she in economy, she's in the middle seat. See, this is why we sell the watch. Regardless, like a true diva, Anne is unfazed. She pulls up in a trench coat, and between that and the bang, she's serving Madame Webb. Remember that time I showed up with just, I don't know what type of dress that's called. They end up hooking up though, and the next morning, Hayes is playing the guitar on the couch. What's happening here? Imagine there's no heaven. Then he invites her to travel Europe with him on tour. And after some convincing, she's like, you know what? Sure, Izzy's at camp. I have nothing else going on. Let's go to Europe. So they decide he's gonna call her his art consultant so she feels more comfortable about it. And now they're flying private. And Anne looks good as hell. Hey everyone, this is Celine. She's my art consultant. Hi. She is not without her haters though. Some people do not want her ass on that tour. There's this whole long tour segment of like showing him on stage and whatever. But when the band does finally have a break, they end up getting this like poolside villa in the south of France with all the other members. And Anne pulls up poolside, looking like Scooby-Doo in disguise. And the girls that were invited to this villa, it's bad. Anne tries to make small talk with them, but they're all like college age, so it's really awkward. How did you guys meet? We need to know the story. Anne says, well, we met at Coachella and he dedicated a song to me. And the girl who asked the question, she turns to Anne and she goes, was the name of the song Closer? And you're sitting there as a viewer and you're like, please, no, please, no. But it was. We pretend to change the set list at the last minute. <laughs> it's a bit. It's a bit. 
Right. Um, and obviously at this point is horrified and she like runs off. And Hayes tries to convince her to stay because he's so inspired by her and he's like writing good music now. And his logic is that, well, if the genders were reversed, nobody would care. So she does leave and in fact goes back to LA. Still flying first class though. Don't get it twisted. If you thought things couldn't get any worse for Miss Anne, I am so sorry to tell you that after a few days back in LA, there are photos of her and Hayes kissing in Paris that leaked to the press and they end up online. <laughs> so now she has to go pick up Izzy from camp while people are blowing up her phone, random people on the campground are either congratulating her or taking pictures with her or pulling whatever this lady did. My daughter has had a crush on Hayes since she was like 10 and she is so heartbroken. Like, girl, what exactly do you want us to say to that? Once Anne's reunited with her daughter, she's obviously upset that she didn't tell her. But after she finds out that Anne and Hayes actually broke up, she was like, why though? I could have handled it. Which honestly, she was real for that, okay? She wanted the nepotism connect. I get it. Like, being the stepdaughter of a British boy band member? That's gotta, like, at least get you on Love Island, right? Is he a feminist? Because that's important <laughs> here. But mom, is he... An unproblematic king? It's been a minute since we've checked in with Hayes though. He's in the studio, working on his craft, and Anne actually shows up to apologize. So they make up and decide that they're actually gonna give the relationship a go. He goes back to Anne's house with Izzy and her friends, and they talk about how the media is gonna be pretty crazy and to like prepare. And Izzy and her friends are like, no worries, we'll be fine. They were in fact not fine. Someone was having fun with these headlines. They're calling her ass Yoko Ono 2.0. Later that day though, when Anne goes to pick up Izzy from school, she realizes that Izzy's super upset and she was getting bullied at school. That's the real message of this movie, guys. The repercussions of Milfury. And shit is still super chaotic at the house when they get home. And she kind of comes to the realization that she just can't do it. So when she goes to pick up Paige from the airport, she's like, listen, we gotta break up. It's too much for Izzy. He tries to reason that he could just leave the band and then they could be together, which boy. Look at the history books. But they do eventually agree later that night that they'll revisit this in five years because Izzy will be out of school and he'll be, according to him, and I'll be some D-list celebrity that nobody gives a shit about. We immediately time travel to five years in the future. Izzy lives in Chicago now. But more importantly, the bangs are gone. Anne's watching TV and she comes across the Graham Norton show and Hayes is performing solo music. Oh, country man. No shade, but this shit is ass. Bring back guard down. The song's clearly about her though, and in the interview, he actually brings up that after his tour, he's gonna be taking a holiday in LA because there's someone he really wants to see there. So time passes, it's another day, Anne comes out of her office in her gallery and she sees someone and goes, who's that talking to that man in that sassy scarf? If I'm being completely honest, I thought this movie was just okay. Is it better than after on a movie level? Yeah. But I think as a story, I'd argue that the idea of you actually is a bigger offender than after. Because while after did originate as a fanfic, if you compare the two as movies, the after franchise is super removed from Harry Styles beyond the accent. While with the idea of you, you're literally following a young male British pop star from a five member boy band and reenacting different pop culture moments on top of it. I do think this movie achieves what it wants to when it comes to Anne's character, when it comes to her grappling with her age and feeling unworthy of certain things because of it, but this is still kind of a weird story the longer you look at it. So I'm just surprised that if anything they leaned into the Wendy and Harry stuff instead of steering away from it. I feel like Anna Todd is somewhere screaming in a pillow right now. Harry does have a bit of experience with media that's kind of inspired by him. He actually produced a TV show called Happy Together where the pop star character was influenced by him that ran from 2018 to 2019. But obviously that's not the same as projects that don't involve him, just wanted to mention this for context sake. Looking at the timeline, it's honestly crazy to see just how long this has been going on and it does make me wonder when it's eventually going to shift to a different pop star and if so which one because there is a huge trend amongst tv shows and movies right now to be able to just adapt stuff and there are a ton of fanfics that they could choose from i'm curious to know what you guys think about these movies though if you've caught any of them don't forget you can get 45 percent off plus free shipping on your first order at thread up with code casey definitely check it out if you're looking for some new clothes for the summer but otherwise really hope you enjoyed and i'll see you in the next one